morning. morning. It's good to be here this morning. David. What do you say about David in 35 minutes? Somebody's done a verse count or whatever and uh, said that um, there's more in the Bible written about David than anybody else other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So where do you start on David? I think the best place to start is at the start. The first mention is always a good place to start. And uh, let's see if we can... And we'll start reading at 1 Samuel chapter 16. And um, that's uh, the first mention of David in the Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 16, I'll read verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Down to verse 6. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? Uh, There's still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise, anoint him, this is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord had come powerfully upon David. When we come to David, and uh, what's your first thought? What do you think about him? Do you remember, what do you remember about him? Is it his anointing? Is it um, his victory over Goliath? Some re- remember his failure with Bathsheba. Others remember that he had problems with, his, with Absalom. His, uh, and he had problems with Saul. Some remember the friendship with Jonathan. Now that's the human way. We look at what is spectacular, what's exciting, what's glorious. When God looks at us, looks at David and remembers him, he remembers something quite different. You find out what God remembers about his man, you have to turn to the New Testament. Some 1,000 years after David's death, Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, reveals what God remembers about David. We find this in Acts chapter 13, verse 22. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. What a testimony for a life. What a testimony he had that God could say, I have found a man after mine own heart, and it was pleasing to the Lord. Let's just backtrack a little bit before David was anointed. King Saul had been anointed and he was made king, but he disobeyed God. And I just want to get this to get the connection that um, when Saul disobeyed God, Samuel went to Saul with God's message. And in 1 Samuel chapter 13, 
and uh, verse 14 we have this you have done a foolish thing Samuel said you have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you if you had he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time but now your kingdom will not endure the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's commands. God wanted a king with a heart that was right toward God, a man with a shepherd's heart, and he found that kind of heart in David. Saul, as he governed uh, Israel, he was a warrior. He wasn't anything else. He was just a warrior. He was never a shepherd. But David had a shepherd's heart because the Lord was his shepherd. David was under authority, so he had the right to exercise authority. And in Psalm 78, verses 70 and 72, we read this. He, that's God, chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to, the shepherd, to be shepherd of his people, Jacob of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands, he led them. God had found the man after his own heart. When Samuel went to Saul, he said, God is seeking a man after his own heart. God has found that man. But what does it mean to be a man after God's own heart? Have you really thought about that? As I was reading through different comments on this, so many people commented about David's life as a king. But he, was, he proclaimed a man after God's own heart when he was a shepherd. He was a man after God's heart as a young man. What does it mean to be a man after God's own heart? First of all, here's a few points. In our Bible reading, we read that he was a shepherd. But there were many shepherds in Israel at the time. So the shepherd part, while it was good, it is not the preeminent part. It's not the defining factor. When he was about to go out and fight Goliath, he told King Saul, but I, I have k killed a bear, I have killed a lion. He's saying, I trusted God. He was courageous. He was willing to even give his life for the sheep. That's a bit more like the shepherd God is looking for. We know that he trusted God because when he went out to fight Goliath, he said, I come in the name of the Lord. And he went out and fought Goliath. When he cared for the sheep, he used to sit down, play the harp. It became so good that in fact that if he was a personal um, musician to Saul later on. But as he played the harp, he obviously sang praises. He sat and wrote hymns. He wrote psalms. So he was worshipping God as he sat out under the stars. And many of the psalms remind us of David's life as a shepherd. Just a couple, Psalm 23, you all know it. The Lord is my shepherd. David knew about sheep. He knew what it meant to be a shepherd. He knew how to trust God as his shepherd. In Psalm 24, the very next psalm, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He's looking around him and he's worshipping God as he sees what's in the world. He sees the heavens and the earth. He said, I worship God and everything in it. In Psalm 25, the very next psalm, verses 4 and 5, it says, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are my God, my Saviour, and my hope in, is in you all day long. David had a real desire to know God. And his hope was in God all day long. David's trust in God had been built up in those years as a shepherd. When he's out in the fields, just him, the sheep, and God. He, he was building that relationship with God. He had faced many challenges, 
and he had trusted God to help him rather than to fear those dangers. And on each occasion, his faith had been built up. God acknowledged that faith and said, David was a man after his own heart. God chose David because he was a man after God's own heart. But when Samuel went to Jesse's place, he didn't know who God had chosen. All he knew was God said, one of Jesse's sons. And they all passed before him. He said, no, no, not him. Don't, don't look at his build. Don't look at how strong he is. He said, God looks at the heart. And got the, David was a man after God's own heart. I can just imagine Samuel when God says, anoint him. This is the one. I can almost feel the excitement. This is him. This is him. Anoint him. And so Samuel anointed him. God had found a man after his own heart. So he was God's choice. That's very important. It was God's choice. Now when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt and into a, to, to the promised land, and just before they went into the promised land, Moses gave many instructions. And he also gave some instructions concerning a king. In Deuteronomy 17, he gave some ins clear instructions. What does a king do? What should a king be like? What should he do? And this is what he says. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it and say, let us set a king over us like the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you one who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over the kingdom in Israel. We've already seen that God has chosen uh, David why did God send Samuel to Jesse of the tribe of Judah and previous to that God had chosen Saul from Benjamin so if you go back to Genesis 48 and if we haven't got time to read that but you can read Genesis 49 verses 8 to 12 we read of Jacob's blessing on Judah and in that blessing, he says that royalty was going to come from his family. Royalty was coming from Judah. That's why Samuel went to Jesse. But I'd like to have a quick look at David as king. How did he measure up to this standard that God had given Moses? How did he measure up to that standard? And... Uh, I want to go down and see if we can tick the boxes. You must not acquire great numbers of horses. Well, what was David's attitude towards this? The principle here is that if you had a great number of horses, it was like in modern day, you've got a great number of tanks, you've got a great number of air, aircraft, you've got, it's a huge army. It's a symbol of strength and power. And God says, no. No. You trust me. So he says, <coughs> excuse me, 
don't collect a, a lot of horses. And in 1 Chronicles 18, verses 3 to 4, we read this. Moreover, David defeated Hadadezer, king of Zobah, in the vicinity of Hamath, and when he went to set up his monument at the Euphrates River, David captured a thousand of his chariots, 7,000 charioteers, 20,000 foot soldiers. He hamstrung all but a hundred of the chariot horses. Hamstrung them. He cut the tendons behind their legs so they couldn't run. He crippled them. All but a hundred. If he was a man who wanted to collect a lot of horses, show off his great army, he would have kept them all. But he didn't. I'll tick that box. He didn't gather a great army. The next one. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. There was common practice in uh, those days for kings to marry the daughters of their, their enemies, really, so that they could try to keep peace. Look at David's attitude to a marriage. In 1 Samuel 18, 27, we read this. David took his men with him and went out and killed 200 Philistines and brought back their foreskins. They counted out the full number to the king so that David might become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave him his daughter, Michael, in marriage. Wife number one. The daughter of Saul. There's another story on that one, but we won't go into that. 1 Samuel 25, verses 42 to 44. The story of David with Nabal and Abigail. Nabal refused to help David. Abigail did, and eventually Nabal dies. And we get to this verse, verse uh, 42. Abigail quickly got on a donkey and attended by her five female servants, went with David's messengers and became his wife. David had also married Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they both were his wives. But Saul had given his daughter Michael, David's wife, to Paltiel, son of Laish, who was from Galim. He had one, now he's got two, he's got three, and he's back to two. And of course we get Bathsheba. We couldn't forget her. In 2 Samuel chapter 11 is a story of uh, David's downfall with the Bathsheba. And this is what we read in verse 26. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David brought her to his house and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. So now he's back to three wives. And in his old age, we read that Abishag was given to him for a companion. I'm not sure whether she is actually married. I, the way it reads, it doesn't sound like it. But for the standards of those days, David was not a man to go after wives. I'll tick that box. He didn't have many wives. He wasn't led astray by them. Then Moses said that uh, he must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. We read this in 2 Samuel 8, 11 to 12. King David dedicated these articles to the Lord as he had done with the silver and gold from all the nations he had subdued, Edom and Moab, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Amalekites, and also dedicated the plunder taken from Hadadezer, son of Rehob, the king of Zobah. David had captured much gold and silver. He could have been very wealthy, could have been very rich. But what's he say there? He dedicated it to the Lord. He collected it and he gave it to the Lord. Another tick. He's not collecting silver and gold. The next one. He's to write a co for himself on a scroll a copy of the law. Well, this is a very hard one to find because I couldn't find anywhere where he actually says that he sat down and wrote the law out. But there are many verses here that indicated that he did. And the first one is Psalm 40, verse 8. He says, I desire to do your will, my God. 
your law is within my heart. He kept that law. He kept it close by. And he says, I've kept it in my heart. And this is what David said about the law in Psalm 19, verses 7 to 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, much more pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is a great reward. David loved God's word. He kept it in his heart. He kept it. And this is what he says about that. He says the, the desire of David's heart is this. Psalm 86 verses 11 and 12. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. These are certainly the words of a man devoted to God's word and to obeying God's word. I'll give him a tick. He's passed. He's done that. Next one. He does not consider yourself better than his fellow Israelites. When David had defeated Goliath, one of the rewards for that act was to be given the daughter of Saul for his wife. This is David's response in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 23. They repeated these words to David, but David said, Do you think it is a small matter to become the king's son-in-law? I am only a poor man and little known. I am only a poor man and little known. I'm not worthy to be the king's son-in-law. And later on, when David is king of all Israel, God sent Nathan, the prophet, to give him a promise. And that's found in 2 Samuel 7, 16. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And look at David's response in verse 18. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and he said, Who am I, sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? David still not did think himself better than his fellow Israelites. He still fulfilled God's plan for the king of Israel. Tick the box. That's all the boxes. He's ticked them all. He's God's chosen man. End of story. Start of part two. I want to have a quick look at David and Bathsheba and the consequences of sin. Now, even though David was chosen by God, he was still subject to temptation and testing. We are chosen by God. We are still subject to testing and temptation. How do we handle it? What, how do we get around this? The events of David's temptation are found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. I just want to look at the first verse of that chapter and pick out some points from that, that verse. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. It's a very important verse at the start of a very serious chapter. It's very important. It says here, it is a time when kings go out to fight. Where was David? He was in camp in Jerusalem. He wasn't out there leading his men. He had failed in that point. He did not take, go out with his army. He would say, well, the king can do anything. He's got all authority. He can do anything. No, he can't. That's wrong. People say today, it's my body. I can do whatever I like with it. No, you can't. That's wrong. 
in freedom of speech, I can say, I want to be able to stand up and say what I want to say. No, you can't. You can't go into a crowded theatre and say, fire! You can't do that. Freedom has a limitation. David's freedom had limitations. And we uh, need to remember that. And uh, David's freedom did not extend to stealing someone's wife. It did not extend to committing adultery. It did not extend to committing murder. Freedom does not, is limited and we have to live within those limitations. David did not live within those limitations. And he grieved God by his sin. When David sinned, he tried to cover it up. But that didn't work. So he sinned again by planning the death of Bathsheba's wife, her husband, Uriah. We have already seen that David had a heart after God's own heart. He had a shepherd's heart. What was wrong? The shepherd wasn't out there leading the sheep. The shepherd was where he was not supposed to be. And we can put ourselves in a position where we can be disobeying God by not being where we should be. We have to do what God tells us to do, be where he wants us to be. So the shepherd king was leading his people, but not as a shepherd should. So in taking this action, he failed God. He failed himself and the people. I'd like to just take a little quote from Warren Worsby. I'll reword it a little bit. And uh, it uh, gives us an example of David's and his actions at this time. Oh, that was the previous. Oh, here. Yeah. When David was at home, he didn't put on his armour. He was subject to attack. I'll get to that in a minute more. We must put on the whole armour of God. And it's found in Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. David didn't put on that helmet of salvation. He needed that helmet of salvation. He needed that helmet to guard his mind. He needed that helmet to guard his uh, thinking. When he looked over that balcony and saw Bathsheba, he should have had his helmet on. He should have been out in the field. He didn't have the helmet on. And he was tempted. He saw Bathsheba and he was tempted. He didn't have the best plate of righteousness. He didn't have that best plate to guard his heart. And he looked at Bathsheba and said, I want her. He didn't have the best plate on. He didn't have the girdle of truth around his, on his waist. He would believe lies. He said, believe the lie. I'm king. I can do what I want. He didn't have the girdle of truth on. He didn't have the sword of the word or the shield of faith. He was helpless before the enemy. We must put on the whole armour of God or we too will be helpless. Remember, without prayer, we have no power. We need to have prayer as well. Because David was in a place where he should not have been and because he did not have the armour of God on, he was defenceless and he succumbed to sin. He thought he could get away with it. But God knew. And God sent Nathan, the prophet, to challenge David. And there are consequences for our sin. In uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, we read these words. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. And so the story goes on, you know it. Down to verse 5, David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that land four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are that man. 
and verse 13, Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. When Nathan gave him that story about that man, David said, he must die. And he must pay back fourfold. Nathan said, God has taken away your sin. God has forgiven you. But there are consequences for your sin. There are still consequences for your sin. David didn't die, but the baby did. Seven days later, that baby died. There were consequences for his sin. But it wasn't just that baby. David said he must pay fourfold. And so David suffered the consequences for that sin. I think I'm missing it. Right, in, um, I'm having trouble reading this. He must pay back four times, and the son who was born to Bathsheba died. While that baby was still alive, David pleaded with God. He thought, there's maybe a chance, just a chance, he will relent. But God says, what he will do, he will do. God said, that baby will die. And he died. Nathan said that part of God's judgment was that the sword would not depart from David's family. And that trouble started almost immediately. Amnon, one of David's sons, had raped Tamar, his half-sister, or the full sister of Absalom. David didn't do anything about it. Absalom was determined to avenge her. So Absalom threw a party. In 2 Samuel 13, Absalom ordered his men, Listen, when Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine, and I say to you, strike Amnon down and kill him. Don't be afraid. Haven't I given you this order? Be strong and brave. So Absalom's men did to Amnon what Absalom had ordered. Son number two, Amnon, is killed by Absalom. Absalom was only exiled for a while. Then he's allowed to return to Jerusalem and he began to undermine David's authority and eventually stole the hearts of the people and rebelled against his father and the whole family had to flee to safely, safety. And you read all this in 2 Samuel chapter 15. Absalom eventually proclaimed himself king. And when a new king comes on throne, they normally get rid of any threat to his, his authority. He gets rid of any threat. Any threat included his father, his brothers. He was going to get rid of them all. And there was a battle between David's army and the army that Absalom had put together. And Absalom was killed by Joab in that battle. Three sons of Di David have now died. The son born to Bathsheba, Amnon, and now Absalom. And in 1 Kings chapter 1, we read these words. When King David was old and well advanced in years, and verse 5 we read, Now Adonijah put himself forward and said, I will be king. Adonijah is going to usurp the authority of D David. He's going to steal the throne. David heard about it and he promptly crowned Solomon king. Solomon established his kingdom and he set about tidying up loose ends. After David's death, Adonijah is killed by Solomon. He was a threat. Adonijah was killed by Solomon. Four sons died according to the proclamation that David had sinned. There were consequences for that sin. David's own judgment was that he must pay four times. 
and he did. But God in his grace, David only saw three of those sons killed. The fourth one was after he died. David thought he could get away with sin. But we must remember that your sin will find you out. Any one of us could be caught up in sin. Remember that any one of us could be caught up in sin. How do we avoid some of those traps? We need to be where God wants us to be. We need to be where God wants us to be. We need to be available for God, serving him. We need to put on that whole armour of God every day. Put it on and use it to protect ourselves from the fiery darts of Satan. And we must be a person after God's own heart. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the lessons we can learn from David. We thank you, Lord, that he was found to be a person after your own heart, a man after your own heart. Lord, help us to follow the example of David in that way. But Lord, help us too to follow uh, the teaching, to learn from the teaching about David's mistakes. Lord, that he didn't put on his armour in two ways. He didn't put on his armour to go to battle. He didn't put on his armour to defend you. And Lord, we just pray that you'll help us to put on the armour of God, that we'll use it to fight the fiery darts of Satan. Lord, we just ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Barry, for the challenge and the encouragements from God's Word and the life of David this morning. Please stay with us now for a